shock the system. Welcome to Dank Discussions with your host, Calican CEO Maynard Breslow. In each episode, you'll learn from the trailblazers, leaders, entrepreneurs, and influencers in the ever-moving, ever-growing cannabis industry. Hey there, everybody. Welcome to Dank Discussions. Today, we're joined by Rob Mejia. Super excited to have Rob. He is the adjunct professor of cannabis studies department at Stockton University. He's also the president of Our Community Harvest, a cannabis education company. And he's a writer for NJ Cannabis Insider. And uh, check out his column. It's actually Prof. Messia's Weed Corner, Professor Messia's Weed Corner. So a lot of great stuff going on. He's been doing education for a long time in the space and uh, super excited to have you on today. Thanks for joining us today, Rob. Thank you. I am happy to be here and ready to talk about all things cannabis hemp. Let's go. I love it. I love it. I mean, you know, it's we it's super exciting to have you on, right? You know, you, we talk to so many great people, whether it be researchers, people in the industry, growers, doctors, and, you know, we've talked to educators in the past, but it's always great, you know, because you are actually out there. We talk so much about education. We talk so much about stigma. We talk so much about how, or how can we change this in future generations? And you're actually living that day to day. You're actually doing that actively, right? Helping people, you know, at Stockton University, right? No, no small feat, obviously. So i um, super excited to have you. And today, you know, before we get into it, you know, just want to let the people know, right? I mean, aside from, you know, as a cannabis professor, you, you teach the cannabis internship preparation, social justice and cannabis, introduction to medical cannabis. So today we're going to be using that whole wealth of knowledge that you have and talking about that and social justice and cannabis jobs, cannabis brands. And of course, we'll also touch on cooking with cannabis. So we have a lot to talk about today and uh, really excited to get into it. But, you know, you know, before we get into all the meat and potatoes, let's start off easy, right? Let our li- listeners know where you're based out of today. Oh, sure. I, I'm in northern New Jersey, so about 25 miles northwest of New York City. And as you know, New Jersey did vote in adult use last November. So we're just getting our industry set up here, and it is very exciting. I have to say, every day you see people applying, you see the zoning come out, you see just all these opportunities that are popping up right and left. And of course, my students will benefit from all of this. So it's, it's a great time to be in New Jersey. No doubt about it. I mean, the excitement, you can definitely feel it. My wife is from Montclair, so I guess not too far from there, you know, uh, Montclair, New Jersey. And it's uh, it's a good place, right? I mean, it's a good place to be right now in terms of cannabis, you know, with uh, the excitement. But not only that, right, I think, you know, looking at how the legislation's come in, I think it kind of um, has done some some good, right? So I guess, you know, we can get right into it or, you know, talk to me about social justice right right away i want to talk about your credentials and talk about all the way back but you know just talking about what you see now in new jersey and how kind of that plays into the social justice and kind of writing those that social inequity that that we've seen you know in in the past you know over the last hundred years of prohibition even before then yeah new jersey has a couple interesting things going on so they did look at what other states did in trying to get people who were targeted by the war on drugs into the industry and so a couple things they're doing is that eventually when we get our industry up and going and it starts generating some serious funds, that uh, 70% of that money is supposed to go to impact zones. And the impact zones are places where you have high unemployment, where you've had uh, large arrests for people of color, primarily for cannabis possession, simple distribution, uh, a lot of nonviolent crimes. And so the income is supposed to go there. And it'll be interesting to see whether they start to offer things like grants, low interest loans, loans with no, no interest at all. And then also what sort of mentoring programs they can put up just to help people get in the industry who are harmed by that war on drugs or to actually help them with things like getting a high school education or just getting a, a well-paying job. So there are those things. The impact funds will make a very big difference. And then also New Jersey allows for micro licenses. And what a micro license is here in New Jersey is you have to be a a citizen of the township that you are in or an adjoining township. And then you can apply for a license in six categories up to a 2,500 square foot facility. So that can be dispensary, cultivation, it can be processing or manufacturing, warehouse distribution or delivery services. So those businesses will not take as much money to get going. So that actually might help a few of the social equity applicants as well. I bet. I mean, you mentioned there, right? It'd be interesting to to see if they do this, if they do that, if they implement mentorship programs, if they implement, you know, low interest rates for minorities, all that kind of fun stuff. I mean, 
isn't that something they kind of should have already done? Do you think that it's something that just later on they'll stumble upon and say, oh, you know what, we should do this? Is it something you think we have to force people to kind of do? Or you think it's something that people just, you know, it'll, it'll come about in its own way? I think it's primarily is going to come about in its own way. And what will happen is the townships that are the impact zones will decide what they want to do with the income. So the New Jersey Cannabis Regulatory Commission, they just said, we're going to devote funds. Which, which is a great first step because obviously you need money to move the market. You need money to train people, educate people, and to give them a stake in the business. But I think letting the local municipalities figure out what they're going to do is probably a smart thing because each township has their own issues. They have their own goals. And I think we're going to see some very unique things. I think we actually might see some um, guaranteed universal income programs like the uh, mayor of Rochester, New York is proposing. So literally the citizens might actually get, might actually get a check that comes from the cannabis income and then they, they can use that the way they want to, hopefully for education, training, daycare, whatever it is that a person needs to uh, have a successful life. So that might be one program. I am a volunteer member of the Atlantic City Cannabis Advisory Committee. And we're looking at things like, we're looking at a lot of job training. So we're looking at job training programs that are already in existence and then trying to fold hemp and cannabis in there and try to use those funds to use programs that are already up and running. And a lot of that, I think, is, is kind of a twofold process. One is trying to get people in the business with good jobs that have benefits where they can actually start to make a life for themselves. And then for a few people, help them be entrepreneurs. Because as you know, to be an entrepreneur, it, it takes a lot. It takes funding. It takes a plan. It takes uh, ex business expertise. You have to have a lot of people helping you. So if you don't have that kind of background, it, it takes a lot, of, a lot of work to do that. But we can start by getting people in the business and using some of their expertise and hopefully give them a, give them a living wage. So in, in Atlantic City, we are working a lot on job creation. Amazing. Amazing. You know, definitely, you know, being an entrepreneur is so difficult. And one of the main things, right, that you need to have is resilience, right? And, and I think that's something that anybody can have, even if they don't have the experience yet, you know, being able to get your ass kicked repeatedly and getting back up and, you know, not knowing what's going to happen and, and being able to, to move forward still. And these are kind of the things that I have to deal with, right? And I think, you know, that's becomes one of the issues that we face in the industry, right, is that, you know, with social equity, you know, we, we social equity candidates, a lot of times they don't have the experience and they don't have kind of the advisors there in place. Right. And but they, they they're candidates. So they they're able to kind of get maybe the license quicker than others. And that kind of maybe opens up the door for predators, you know, kind of predatory kind of loans, predatory kind of relationships, you know, where people say, OK, cool, I'll be your backer, I'll be your investor. But really, they just want to use the person to, to kind of get the, you know, get the license or anything like that or you know, what can, what can a person do to really protect themselves or when they want to move forward in this way? I mean, it's, it's such a shame that it ends up like that in so many cases. Yeah, we, we do see that. And one thing that the New Jersey Regulatory Commission put in place are these management service agreements and, and they're limited by number. So basically the idea was that you will have social equity applicants that will need a lot of expertise and that's great. And they should be able to tap into that. But at the same time, we need to make sure that, that those companies are not taking over ownership in a brief amount of time. So there is a rule that the agreements have to be in place for, for three years. So the social equ equity applicant at least has ownership of that for three years versus somebody just trying to put them on an application and then trying to buy them out, which does happen in, in a lot of different places. So yeah. I think kind of limiting those relationships is smart. And then also giving people a, a chance, a certain number of years to get their business going, that also helps. But then there will be a few cases where there'll be applicants that will want to sell their business in three years and then possibly go do something else. And that's, that's fine as well. So I do think those limitations are important, but you do need people that are helping you read the agreements that you're signing because some of them can definitely, you know, people can be taken advantage of, unfortunately. But that's also something that we do in Atlantic City is help people who are applicants and try to set them up with reputable people, try to help them with funding, zoning, pretty much anything we can. I kind of think of ourselves as kind of like cannabis liaisons. We'll try to help you figure out the problems. We'll try to connect you with the right people. We'll try to get you up and going. Amazing. No, and you know, you do hear these stories. And I think sometimes maybe these, these stories, maybe they outweigh 
the good that's going on, right? You know, because they're so shocking and so disappointing and everything. So maybe sometimes they stick in our mind a little more. I mean, you being part of these committees and you being there kind of on the on the on the ground level, kind of helping people in these processes. I mean, is are those kind of more few and far between? Do you see more a lot positive success stories in, in this regard? Or do these kind of you know things happen all too often? At least right now, I'm seeing a lot of positives in New Jersey because we do have people who are in these impact zones and and they're all taking ownership of trying to help other people. So it it is a good community and you do see a lot of people who are really putting themselves out there who are giving their time, their money, their expertise. So so at least for right now, I I feel fairly positive that I think we have a a lot of good things going on and hopefully they'll continue. But it is a lot of of people, a lot of small axes who are out there just uh, grinding every day to help other people in their communities. So New Jersey has 564 townships and each one of our townships are so different. But if you get the right people who are, who are devoted to the right things in those impact zones, I think we can make a huge difference. Amazing. No, very good. And, you know, you mentioned their right expertise and, you know, I'm really grateful. You know, we've been able to have a lot of great experts on this show and I'm really grateful to have you on, right? You know, I know we just kind of like jumped right into it because it's <laughs> such a recent thing, right? With New Jersey and and obviously it's something and I want to, there's a lot more to, to, to dive into as well and what we're talking about, but just to kind of backtrack a little bit, right? I mean, you know, as a professor and cannabis professor, you probably live in your dream, right? I mean, probably something that you've been wanting to do. And and now this is, you know, the we live in the future, I guess, so to speak, right? Despite all the kind of negative things that we hear, we really have made a lot of progress, I feel, right? So, I mean, talk to me about kind of your background, Rob, you know, and is Rob okay, Professor Rob, Professor Mejia, right? What's kind of like the, the right way, right? You know, so, but talk to me, you know, kind of your background, your history with cannabis, and kind of what's led you to now being, you know, su- such a great educator in the space. Sure. And, and, and you're right. In some ways, this is kind of living the dream. I do have to say that when I talk to other people, and of course, you know, that what, what do you do? Oh, I'm a cannabis professor. It's pretty remarkable we could do that. I do remind you. would have been the same said, 40 years ago, right? 30 years ago, 20 years ago, 10 years ago. That, even, you know, I mean, I don't know. You've probably been in this for a while, but, you know, talking to me. Yeah, absolutely. So I do remind the students, I say, you know, it's pretty remarkable. Here you are at a four-year state university. You're getting credit. You're able to minor in cannabis studies. You're going into a business that's booming, that has more job opportunities yeah. now than virtually any other area you could think of. Uh, tech and healthcare are probably pretty close in a few areas, but I mean, you're, you're in a vibrant space and you're defining the market and you're going to be the ones that will have the real impact. So I, I find all that so so exciting and kind of remarkable. That yeah, there you are in a state university talking about cannabis. Pretty amazing. But the, the, the quick story about how I sort of got started. I do come from a, a very large family. I'm actually one of 13 kids. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> I love that. I mean, I'm it, on it my first, I'm, but we're about to have our first not too not too far off. So I mean, not gonna say 13, but it's great to hear, you know, th- <laughs> my mom's one of one of seven, you know, 13 and you know, uh healthy, healthy babies, healthy kids growing up. I mean, that's good stuff. Absolutely. Well, congratulations on your first. I have to say what a, what a remarkable journey it will be for you. Uh, it, but growing up in such a big family, we there was actually a lot of educators in our family. So my dad was a high school oh. teacher for 30 something years. My mom actually went back to school and uh, got her master's and then taught early childhood education in college. I have a couple of brothers and sisters who are educators. So a, a lot of us come from an education background. I actually went into publishing first. And so I was working in publishing and education, actually the exciting world of college textbooks that I did for about, about a decade and then got into licensing and merchandising. But I really started researching oh, cannabis. Because, Sorry, I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we can talk about that in a minute too. That is really interesting as well. But I started doing the, the real research because my older sister, Teresa, unfortunately got uterine cancer. And so when she did, she, she was in uh, Cleveland, so I went out to go visit her quite often. But she went from being a healthy mid fifties woman who, you know, she, she ate well, she jogged, she had good social relationships. So, so warm, just a warm, wonderful person, but they put her on opioids for the first time. And unfortunately she got kind of foggy. She wasn't present. And then also she, she was really losing her appetite. And so during that time, I remember wondering, you know, why is nobody offering her medical cannabis? And I know it would help her with her pain and then also help to stimulate her appetite. But unfortunately, we never really got to see what that would have done for her because she did pass fairly quickly. But but that, yeah. But that but that question really stuck with me, and I thought, you know what? I still have eleven siblings. My parents are still alive. I have a bunch of friends, and I, I want to be knowledgeable in case I'm in this position again about what medical cannabis can do. So I did start pretty much from the med perspective and started doing a lot of research. And 
and then really just pivoted my career over from running a merchandising and what's called a licensing company where you take brand names, images, and put it on put it on product, basically. And I pivoted from that over to cannabis. So I started writing a book. I wrote the Essential Cannabis book. I wrote the Essential Cannabis Journal. I was a writer for the Spokesman Review. I did a bunch of seminars. I did cooking with cannabis demonstrations. I mean, I, I'm one of those people that if I find something interesting, and I, and I find cannabis and hemp absolutely just fascinating, whether it's from growing, from the social perspectives, from job creation to the products you can make from it. I mean, anything, just fascinated. So I happily dove down that rabbit hole and, and it was still there. And, and, and again, because I like so many things about it, I think it worked well that I, that I became kind of a, a generalist. And so I, I like to get people involved in cannabis and hemp if they're interested and then give them references where they can go much deeper into the different areas if they want to. So, so yeah, it just made, it made sense for me to kind of jump into the cannabis education part of it. And I, I do really enjoy it. I mean, it's not every day that you get somebody who actually wrote the book on cannabis, right? You know, so it's <laughs> it's great stuff, you know, Essentials Cannabis book. And and like you said, right? I mean, the, the truth of the matter is, is that it is so fascinating. Everything is fascinating about it. I mean, this podcast has been as much as it is for, for the people out there. It's been a huge education for me, right? I mean, being able to have people who are at the top of their field and, and so many different aspects of the industry. It's not really often that you can talk about that there's so many different things and be so good at one thing and not know anything about the other side kind of thing, you know? So, you know, like you're saying, growing, right? How to genetics, how to, how to grow the plant, how to, how to really push the plant to, to yield and with quality. And, and then that's just one side and talking about cannabinoids and talking about the research and talking about, you know, new cannabinoids and terpenes and flavonoids. And then that's just one aspect and talking about the industrial hemp and, you know, and then talking about, right. Like, like we start off talking about the, the social side of everything and the history of cannabis and how we got here and, <laughs> and you know, prohibition and, and coming out of this and legislation. And it's like, is there anything else like cannabis? Like, is there anything that like, mirrors any of these aspects you'd be hard pressed i, I know sometimes people say well when, when the dot-com era came up that was a little bit of like mm. it because you know exciting new industry a lot of different possibilities but obviously with something like cannabis that can be part of people's daily lives it can be part of a health regimen it can change it can change lives it might create generational wealth for some people so i mean people do occasionally say that cannabis could change the world and i i, I do think that cannabis and hemp in many ways can and will Amazing. Amazing. I mean, there's so much stuff, obviously. And yeah, the dot com, I guess, stands out in terms of newer industries. Right. But it's it doesn't have the history. Definitely not the you know, some would say tens of thousands of years of history. Right. You know, thousands of years of history there of of, of human use and, and, and all that fun stuff. And I mean, we have endocannabinoid systems. Right. So there, there's something there for mammals evolutionary wise all the way back. Right. I mean, so I guess with all the plethora of things that you teach, Right. What is the, the thing that really, really, really excites you the most? I think it's probably when the internship students come in and some of them know that they want to go to a certain area. So some know they want to go into cultivation, some want to go into marketing, but then there are a lot that don't really know. And they also don't know how, how deep the business goes. Mm -hmm. so I think when most students come in, they do know there's cultivation. There's that middle step of processing where they think of a kind of packaging, edibles, that kind of thing. They might know there's a lab component, and then they know there's the retail part of it, the dispensary. But I think the part that they don't know oftentimes is that there's things like there's tourism, there's, there's dinner parties, there's back office, there's web design, there's security camera installation. They, I mean, if you can think about it, transpo, you know, pro know, product creation, distribution, warehousing, eventually there'll be international opportunities that it just goes on and on. So I think the thing I like the most is to just introduce students to as many possibilities as I can, and then also to see them get out in the field and to succeed. So last year we did a, a career fair and business expo. And the nice part was I set up a panel and the panel was made up of three of my former students who were all in the industry, all doing different things and all doing very well. So I had one who was working for Benibus Health, which is a medical cannabis insurance company. And, I, and they're, so they're trying to get insurance to cover medical cannabis. I think that's fabulous. Wow. Then I have a, a young lady who's a cultivator. She'd been cultivating for two years. And then the third person had started a traditional career. So he was a, a wellness technician, butt tender, and then moved into marketing and now community outreach. So these were three students who had sat in my class two years ago. Now they're colleagues and now they are doing their own thing and they are making an impact. And for me, that was like, wow, this is a pretty amazing moment. 
Amazing, amazing. It's, it's really great, you know, and, and like you said, there's so much stuff there to, to really look, right? It's like marketing, What? How, why, why would marketing be <laughs> cannabis, right? I mean, isn't it just kind of like if you build it, they will come, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's like if you grow it, I mean, isn't there just unlimited supply of, you know, unlimited buyers and, and there's always demand and people obviously in the industry are seeing that, right? And, and talk to me about a little bit about that, right? Like how have things changed? You know, you've been doing this for 10 years, right? As, as a professor, is that how long? Well, I've been a professor for about two and a half because Dr. started their program back in 2018, but I had okay, been yeah, doing yeah. a lot of research and seminars before that. And yeah, I'd even had a chance to work a little bit in Colorado. And then my brother moved to Uruguay. So I, I was out there when they started yeah. to legalize. So yeah, I've kind of been doing different things for a while, but I've been a professor for about two, two and a half. Yeah. And I guess, you know, people coming in, right? I mean, are we talking about what, what age groups are, are people who are coming in and is it just part of the, the program or part of a bigger curriculum? Yeah, the classes are pretty popular. So there are five classes that they take, including a, an internship class uh, where they actually get on the job experience and those classes fill up pretty quickly. And, and it is mostly traditional student population, although I do have a few older students who, who are coming back for their degrees. And especially in the internship class, one thing that I, I do tell them up front, and it's right on the course description, is that it's it's better if you're going to be 21 or at least turn 21 during the time you're in the class so that you can have plant-touching opportunities if that's what you want. If you don't want those, then you can be under 21. So I, pretty much about 90% of the students are traditional college age, and they are just, they're just curious students. They come from a lot of different majors. The health areas are big, nursing, exercise science, physical therapy. And then also business area attracts a lot. And then in the middle, anybody you could think of, computer science, psychology, social, English, com, you, you, you name it. So they can major in anything. And then at Stockton, they can get their minor in cannabis studies with those five classes. So it is quite a broad group of students. And some have amazing cannabis knowledge and some have some pretty good cannabis knowledge that also needs to be kind of built up over the semester. So, so pretty good grab bag and, and a good community. I do tell them, you know, look around your classroom because these are the people you, that you're going to be working with, working for. These are your entrepreneurs. These are your leads. So yeah, let's build, let's, let's help each other. Let's build up a good community here. And let's all, we'll all be more successful if we work together. No, definitely. I mean, that's the whole thing, right? I think that this is kind of the key, you know, that we maybe share in this industry that we don't really have in many other, once again, right, there's not really too many parallels, right, where it's not just an industry, but it really is a community. You know, it really yep. is a community, you know, we're before we got on, we we're schmoozing about all the different people that we have had on that you're that you're close with. And, and, you know, it, it's, it's so great, you know, that really, it, the bonds and the friendships, you know, with our colleagues, with people doing in different places, it's not like other industries where, you know, somebody's a competitor, so to speak, right? I think that that's where people kind of get mixed up and, you know, trying to compete with each other and, you know, who ends up winning in, in our industry if, you know, the, the bigger companies and, you know, legislators and kind of, you know, d divide and conquer kind of thing. I think really it's, it's so important, you know, bring this back, you know, considering the history of cannabis that we all work together and kind of building it. Right. So, and that's so cool about the internship, right? So I wish that was something that could have been, you know, that was around when I was there. Right. And, and what other place, once again, where you have to be 21 to be able to, to work in a, you know, to, to work internship in that, in that regard as well. So, so is that something that is partly in class and then partly you guys kind of hook them up with internships or talking about how that program really works. I know you mentioned that there's so many different uh, places where, where people can kind of focus their expertise on. Oh, sure. And, and actually, I, I do appreciate your comment about the cannabis community. That's one thing that I did find out early on is that people are willing to share their information, their knowledge and their connections, especially when you prove that you are genuine and you're doing the work um, that's that, the main, that, we, that we all do. Really work together. You care about the plan, you know, so much yes. of what we do and sorry to cut you off. Right. But so much of what we do is, is kind of like, whether it be people who are coming on the podcast or, or, or prospective clients, right. It's kind of like vetting them. Like, why are you in the industry? Like, why do you want to be here? You know, like yeah. you may be successful, you know, quote unquote, and be making a lot of money, but to you, it's just, could, you could be doing anything. You could be selling socks, you know, and it doesn't really, doesn't really mean any, any different, right. It could be doing pallets, whatever. There's so many different industries that somebody could be in. Why are you, why cannabis, you know, yeah. and, and really, you know, the, the passion is, is probably, you know, second to none for me, right. It's something that I grew up being passionate about, you know, so we can pretty much 
you know, sniff each other out right off the bat, right? When you can tell somebody, oh man, these guys, this is a real one. This guy's, this guy's cool. This guy's been in it for a long time. Or even if they haven't been in for a long time, like they're in it for, for a real reason, right? They're in it for something that they're passionate about. Or, you know, unfortunately all too often as well, you hear, you know, and I'm, I'm so sorry to hear about your sister, right? And, and unfortunately it takes a lot of time, those kinds of stories for people to even give cannabis a chance because of the stigma and because of all the things that have been, you know, kind of in, in, taught to us from a young age and, and uh, hard to overcome, um, especially for, for older people. So. Yeah, absolutely. And to jump to your question about the, the internship. So what happens is they, they take a, a, an internship class. So that's all classroom practice. Although we do have a bunch of speakers that end up being uh, good leads as well. And then as a separate quote course, that's when they do their internship. So that's when they go, ah, and they, can work, they can work at a cultivation center, they can work at a, at a hemp farm, they can work at dispensary, they can design a website, we have people working for an app, medical app company. So it really depends on kind of where they want to go. And we've been able to place students in all kinds of interesting areas, including things like hospitality and tourism. So we have a student that, that does that, actually books events, and then works with a California company that does wine and weed tours. So I, I, I like to think that the internships are only limited by the students' imaginations. And if there's something out there, I'll try to connect them. And then I also teach them how to reach out and how to network to and how to do research into fi finding what it is that you want to that you want to pursue. So, so part of what we do in the internship class is I tell them, you know, we, we have basic assignments and the assignments are, are research based. And if you want to look and you want to go to California, Colorado, or whatever, let's talk about making this assignment tailored to what you want to find out. So research the Colorado market. Go ahead. That's what you that's what you want to do. Let's put your time there. If you want to know Jersey, let's do Jersey. So I do spend a good amount of time with each student trying to tailor their experience so they can go to where they want to go. And if they don't know where they want to go, my job is just to kind of bolster their entire cannabis education background and to introduce them to opportunities. I love it. I mean, I really do want to talk about some of the things that you teach and getting into kind of deep diving that, but this is so fascinating to me, right? Because it's not often that that, you know, this is such a new thing. This wasn't something that was around before in that regard. But talk to me, you know, so when people do come in, right, I mean, are, do you see that most of them want to be a couple, a couple of questions here? Do you see the most of them want to be plant touching and they see the glamour of that and this is like where they want to be? Or do you see, you know, people are kind of more business savvy and they want to be in ancillary business? That's one part of the question. But the second part, I mean, you know, you hear as well, right, so many times, people who are plant touching people who own dispensaries and like, man, I wouldn't wish this for my worst enemy. Right. I mean, is it also part of the education? Like, Hey, guess what? Like it's not all crack. It's a cracked up to be right. It's not just all, we're not just like, people aren't just printing money in the cannabis industry. It's not just, you know, you're going to, you're going to get in and they're going to see all the success. And I mean, is that part of the education as well? Or how do people kind of view that? Yeah, we do, we do talk a lot about sort of the obstacles and also about compliance. I do point out to them that if you're in the cannabis business, you're in the compliance business. Exactly. And, and, right. and you, either, you either better be good at keeping records or you better find people who are good at, exactly. good at keeping records and build up your network. And a lot of that comes from the, from the speakers too. So the expert speakers that I have in class all come from different areas. So uh, we were talking before, and I actually had two legacy members who came in to my class yesterday and talked about what the market was before it started to become regulated and uh, legalized. And then next week, they'll be the head of the, the president of the New Jersey Cannabis Business Association. So of course, he can, he's like, they're like the Chamber of Commerce of uh, New Jersey Cannabis. But each of the speakers does talk about sort of the challenges that they've had and then also some of the, some of the kind of uh, victories that they've had as well. So I do know the students are introduced to the kind of obstacles or challenges that you have, but also uh, so many of them come in and they are so determined. And I would say probably about 20% really have a very personal relationship with the plant. They love the plant and they talk about it. Oh, yeah. They talk about soil amendments and pest management. And, you know, sometimes we go off into some really pretty deep, interesting discussions and then I would say there, there are, you do get a good streak of uh, good cross section of people that are very entrepreneurial and they do want to do their own thing. And so they're trying to figure out what it's going to be. And then in between is just about everybody else. But I do have a good section that do want to work with plants and a good section that do want to do their own business. Yeah, no, very good. And, you know, yeah, I mean, just 
Anybody, most of the people that we have in the industry know because, you know, I should say most people who listen to this podcast know because a good chunk of uh, the, our listeners are in the industry. So they know it's not all it's cracked up to be. And like you said, right, we don't, we're not in the cannabis industry. We're in the compliance industry. And there's really so much to, to learn. It's always evolving, right, in, in that regard. Uh, I, I, I do think one thing I want to do at our next Cannabis Career Fair and Business Expo is to have a panel and, and I'm, I haven't arrived on the name yet, but it's going to be something like Cannabis Fail Fest. And basically what it will yeah. be is panel, panel, panel members who talk about the mistakes that they made so that people who go in later hopefully will not make those same mistakes. Because you do certainly learn from a lot of people who say, well, this is what I did first and I should have you know, gotten either a different location or different financing or I should have started in hydroponics instead of with soil or, or whatever, it, whatever valuable lesson that they can impart. So, so I'm going to try to formulate that panel, and I think that will be very helpful for the audience because you do learn a lot from yeah. your personal failures and then from what other people do as well. No, definitely. I mean, I think that's part of talking about entrepreneurship at the beginning, right? And, and it's, we, that's one of the main things, right? It's just learning what not to do. And, and I think sometimes we can learn it. We can see other people or we can hear stories, but it seems like, you know, every situation is slightly different and you kind of just have to be in it and, and make that bad decision and realize, okay, cool. This is, that was a mistake, you know, kind of thing. And, and we don't talk about those kind of failures enough, right? The swing and the miss is enough. I think it's so easy to get caught up in that glamor and in the Instagram world in the kind of, you know, viewing as everybody is having a great time. I'm the only one who's struggling. As we know, anybody who owns a business, anybody who's an entrepreneur, anybody, you know, I mean, we're all human beings, right? So we all have our own challenges and obstacles to overcome, right? So I yeah. think it's definitely something now, you know, I love that having a, having a panel, people, you know, again, they're asked and, and what learning what to do there. I guess, you know, from the internships, right? I mean, we're talking about cannabis jobs and we're talking about the beginning, how many jobs are being created with this industry and how many more will continue to be created and as it expands into other areas and not even talk about industrial hemp and what that's going to do for us and, and everything like that. I mean, is job placement something else that that's uh, involved in the curriculum or is that kind of on their own afterwards or how does that work? We work pretty closely with our career ed center. So we have a, a career ed center and what they do is they work with uh, cannabis companies and get them to onboard onto a software program called Handshake. And so what happens is once a company registers, you can go there in there as a Stockton student and you can just do your research on who has opportunities. So you can put cultivation and all the cultivation jobs will pop up and then you can uh, send your resume, you can network with them, you can try to set up an interview. So that, that's a lot of it. So I would say between working with the Career Ed Center, the students doing their own research, and then actually with my network as well. So one thing I do during class is I, I always put up like two or three internships that I, that I know of for my own network. Sometimes they're very specific things. And then if students are interested, they tell me I connect with them. And oftentimes that uh, ends up being pretty success, successful as well. But it's also you know nearly impossible for me to place all 30 of them, but I maybe do like about a third per class. So about, I probably get about 10 internships per semester for students. That's not bad. That's not bad. You know, I mean, I mean, it's, it's not easy. And like you said, you know, people are pretty open and, you know, want to share in this, in the cannabis community and everything, unless you've been, you know, you just got your, your master grower and you've just got these genetics that you've been working on for all these, all these years. Right? And it's, <laughs> it's not so easy, right. Giving up the, tr the tricks of the trade, you know, and uh, you got these billion dollar grows and all this stuff going on nowadays. It's pretty, pretty well, cool. well, well you, well, you can also imagine that if you're a cannabis business and you have someone who is a college student who approaches you, that of course you want to help the next generation of people who are coming in the cannabis industry and who also have a degree and have commitment. So I find that that being a college cannabis professor and then having cannabis students in college, that that opens up so many doors and businesses are delighted to have the students there. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, also here, you know, we can edit this, right? But you also mentioned here cannabis brands, right? Was there something specific about cannabis brands that you wanted to touch on? Just that I think that right now, since we're in the infancy of the business and since it's so state-based, that I think a lot of people forget that eventually there will be cannabis brands and you're starting to see a few of them and they will go across the country. So at some point, the product that somebody gets in California is going to be the same product that they can get in New Jersey, Massachusetts, Michigan, wherever it is. And they're going to follow that brand. Just like you get a Coca-Cola and you know what that experience is like. It can be the same way with with cannabis. So I do think branding is going to be pretty important. And you do see a few brands like like Wana, W-I-N-A, that does the gummies. They're the big uh, player in Colorado. They've done a couple agreements, but there's a few. There's Kiva Chocolate. So there's a few that you start to hear about. 
mm-hmm. that I think eventually will become national brands. So I, I do tell the students a couple opportunities you might want to look at is see if there's some brand that you might want to start to establish here that's unique that you know can go across the country at some day. That's one thing you can definitely look at. And also you can take a look at some of the websites that people haven't gotten to. And right now those may become quite popular too. And you could build um, a big audience that way too. So there's sort of a smaller, more innovative things that I think you could do with brands because at some point, I think they will become important. So, yes. Yeah, so, you know, talking about the future and you're really teaching here the future generation of the cannabis industry, obviously. And one thing that you, you know, we talked about the dot com and the parallels within it, right? It's one thing that we haven't seen yet kind of emerge out of the cannabis industry, as you see. I mean, obviously, part of it because of, you know, legalization in different states and not being able, you know, to, to be kind of nationwide in that regard. But you see it also in the hemp industry, right? You see it. Um, with this on the CBD side, and there's a few big players around, but you haven't really seen the emergence of big cannabis brands so far, right? I mean, you know, just big players who've kind of overtaken and, and kind of grown from a grassroots kind of place, like you would see in other industries, right? Is that something that you know you're hoping to change here with with your students, or kind of how do you see that playing out in the future? Well, that's kind of one of those interesting quandaries because, of course, it takes so much to get cannabis businesses going in terms of capital and real estate and compliance and you just go on and on so we do have some of the big players and and in new jersey our program was designed where we do have a lot of msos multi-state operators who are who are running the business now we will have a lot of small operators coming up and so the hard part for me is on the one hand i want to get my students opportunities i want to put them in jobs but a lot of the jobs and opportunities i end up putting them in are with these big players because they're the ones that have the they have the jobs, the infrastructure, the expertise right now. So, so part of me is, I, I know I'm helping some of the big MSOs, but then another big part of me is like, I'm really pulling for the small growers and the craft growers, the individuals and social equity. And I'm hoping that at some point that we'll have that kind of choice where I, I do talk to students and say, you know, if you want to make an impact, if you have a kind of a mission in your life, you, you should look at the company that you're connecting with and make sure that their values align with your values. And Maybe, maybe in the short run, you have to work at one of the big MSOs and get some knowledge and that kind of thing. But at some point, maybe you can do your own thing, or maybe you can work with social equity applicants or small craft growers, and maybe that's more of what you want to do. So, I mean, you, you can tell that I really struggle with that because there's the practical part of, you know, I have to give, give my students jobs and, and, you know, real skills and opportunities and, and where they are right now with the big MSOs. Where would I like to really give them all the opportunities with all the small people that I'm really pulling for? No, and that's that's such a great point, right? I mean, I think that we touched on that a little bit, right, in terms of, you know, the culture, the cannabis community, you know, and there's people who are doing a really big things, and it's great to see people succeeding within the industry. But, you know, a lot of these people, they came from different sectors, right, and they came into it because it's, you know, a good market opportunity, quote, unquote. And there's nothing necessarily inherently wrong with that, right? I mean, it's just a matter of how they treat, like, you know, how they treat the plan, how they treat the culture, what they think about the culture, what legacy market, right? I think, you know, making all this money, you know, with, without the legacy market in mind or without those who have, you know, been affected by the war on drugs, by social inequity, I think is just pretty backwards and kind of taking a step backwards in a lot of different ways, right? So, and that's something that we want to educate on as well, you know, with, with the with the new generation. And I guess, you know, of course you want to play place them with these, uh, the people that we are rooting for, right? So to speak, but how do you kind of teach this new generation when they go in with the MSOs? Like, hey, you know what? Like maybe you can help change this culture or is that something that it's just kind of like, as they say, the rot, the fish rots from the head, right? So it's something that's, you know, something from on the top, you know, kind of thing that comes down. But is it's just something that, okay, cool. You can go in here to the MSO for gaining some experience and then you can kind of move over to different places in the industry or, or are people really finding places they can stick that match that that culture and that drive in these big... Yeah, areas? I would say it's a, a little bit of each. So I do know that there are some students who are trying to change a little bit of the culture from within, or they're finding the right spots within those big companies. So two quick examples are, I do have a student who is a cultivator and at her facility, she has proposed a recycling program because as you know, we have a huge waste problem in the cannabis industry in terms of the plastics that we use for oh, the containers. Yeah. It's been a big topic that we brought up a lot in recent episodes has been, you know, I've, I've definitely, you know, uh, learned a lot from that for sure. So it's a huge issue. 
Yeah. So, so she has a, a program that she's put or she's trying to put in place that would actually be kind of a loyalty program where the uh, patients could bring back their plastic vials and then get a, you know, 50 cents back on it or whatever, get something, uh, some kind of loyalty points in order to give kind of an inducement for people to bring back their plastics instead of just throwing them away. So that's kind of, that's kind of a baby step, but it's at least trying to change the culture. And then I am finding that the big companies have, have realized, or they're getting smart about knowing that they need diversity officers and they need social equity officers. And so they do a lot of different programs and they do support nonprofits. And so I am seeing the big people that have those offices now and I connect with a lot of those people. And some of my students are interested in eventually being that part of the equation within within the big industry. So I do think you can find your, your right place where you can have impact in a large company. You can also try to change the culture from within, or you can make the choice to try to go somewhere else from the very beginning. No, definitely. And, you know, and hopefully we'll, we'll see those changes. You know, I think we see it with, with stigma and we seeing people growing and obviously people are very excited, right? Your, your classes fill up uh, very quickly, as you mentioned. And, you know, so that that's one side, right? But another thing that you have got going on and we haven't even touched on it yet is our community harvest, right? So aside from being, you know, a professor at Stockton University, right? So you, you're also talking about our community harvest. What is it? What's the point? Uh, you know, what's the goal here? Sure. So that's my cannabis education company. And essentially what we do is create a lot of educational materials for many different audiences. So it could be something as simple as a brochure, a poster, online content, web content. Uh, We've done online courses, in-person seminars, cooking demonstrations, anything that kind of goes under the umbrella of cannabis, we'll do it. So the, the bigger things we're working on right now is that New Jersey actually has a required course for people who enter the cannabis industry. And so they have to take a kind of a cannabis 101 that covers eight points, covers things like history and prohibition. It covers a few definitions like what a, what a chemovar is. It talks about advertising rules and regulations. So if you wanted to become a, a wellness technician or a bud tender, you would have to take that class and you'd have to pass that. And then, and then you get that along with your background check, fingerprinting, all that, and then you can start in. So you get your badge. Well, New Jersey is requiring that course, which is pretty amazing. Obviously our community harvest is very interested in getting that course created and then also approved by the state so that anybody who gets in the industry, hopefully they'll work with our community harvest and, and take that class. So that's one example. And then we did create an online social justice and cannabis class and also an introduction to industry class, which we've sold to educational institutions. So those are kind of the bigger things I'm working on. I have to say the online classes, they take a lot of work, oh, yeah. um, but, but they also have a lot of reach too. So you can imagine once I get this going, it, it can be, it'll, it'll be fantastic. Amazing. What's kind of been your biggest challenge there with our community harvest and, and getting everything going and, and getting it out there? Really, it's time. It's time because between the, the teaching duties that I have and that I am revising the essential cannabis book and I'm actually expanding it quite a bit too. So that takes a ton of work. I have my uh, columns that I write and they're on all kinds of different things. So I just did one on real estate that required a lot of research for Black History Month. I'm doing one on jazz and cannabis, which has been a lot of fun. So, so really, I think part of it is that I probably get to, I, I probably need to learn how to say no a little more often uh, just because I, I'm so busy that the biggest challenge is just getting enough time to carve out uh, a certain amount of time per day to progress all these different projects. But, you know, that's, I, I, lo- I love what I'm doing. So, you know, I'll make it happen. You know, that's definitely part of it, right? You know, being able to, to focus on, on, the, on the goals and, you know, I'm, I'm sure you're torn in all many different ways, right? You, you know, you mentioned on some of the committees are on and teaching and, and writing and, and obviously our community harvest. So a lot of, a lot of great things there, obviously. So, and then you also mentioned earlier, right? I mean, merchandising, is this something of the past that now, Oh, I used to do merchandising, right? It reminds me of uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, space balls, right? You know, it's like a merchandise. You know, that's what I think. Is that something? Oh, wait, that's in the past now. Or do you see your past Rob Mejia self combining with your current, cannabis and everything and and you know bring that knowledge again once again as you see that as emerging market within the industry as well it, absolutely and i do have a couple of cannabis artists that i represent so i do represent pat ryan and he was the artist back in the 80s and he came up with a whole concept called california home growers association 
a fictional a fictional organization but what he did is he had eight pieces of our artwork that he put under the umbrella that all have like an 80s a little bit like mad magazine type vibe to it but there's there's characters like there's super, super skunk <laughs> there's a there's top of the morning which is like a farm scene there's harvest moon but it's very cool kind of retro looking stuff and we have we have a line of uh, t-shirts and other things that that that's on so that's been a lot of fun i work with lawrence cherniak who does a lot of repeat patterns of the cannabis leaf and so there's a lot of products that have that on there too and then probably the most innovative and coolest merchandise product i have is there's a company called litographs and they took my essential cannabis book and they printed forty thousand words of the book onto t-shirts pillows shower curtains scarves hoodies puzzles and then they they kind of carved out a, a decorative element in the middle that has kind of a, a plant in it so i actually have a t-shirt that has my book on it so if you were within two feet of me you could read the book and it looks just like a like a printed product but anyway that 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 That's is a cool a cool example of merchandise i have to say i really love that and my shower upstairs has a has a shower curtain on it that's that's got the big cannabis leaf and my book on it <laughs> Love it. See, there you go. You know, bring bring everything in. There's more to be done within the industry. And, you know, I think that's, uh, you know, people can bring in. Not everybody necessarily is, you know, 21 and undergrad and and just getting educated. I think a lot of people have a lot of worldly experience and they've been out there and maybe they're pretty newer to the cannabis industry and they think they're starting over. But so much of it is bringing in our experience, our expertise into what we're doing now, right? And not just trying to like forget yeah. about what's what's happened or whatever else like that. So yeah. I mean, I mean, if you think about it, if you go into a lot of these little gift and stationary stores and you see all the all the wine themed products. So you have wine themed towels and you have, you know, coasters and decorative things. At some point that's going to be cannabis. I mean, at, at, at some point you're going to see oh, signs yeah. that say it, it's, it's 420 somewhere and it'll be on pillows and blankets yeah. and all kinds of stuff. And so yeah, that, that merchandise will come. It just takes a while. Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. And, you know, I mean, you have so much stuff going on, right? You mentioned obviously over here, you know, with everything going on with our community harvest and online classes and, and everything that goes along with that. I mean, what else can we have here to expect not only from our community harvest, but uh, from Rob Mejia, what else do you have here coming down uh, the pipeline here in the future? More cooking events, I hope. So as, as we kind of open things up, I do cooking demonstrations that always have, of course, a huge dose of education along with them. But, but I love those events. I usually pair with a, a local chef. Sometimes I do them on my own. But basically, you get an audience of people who want to experience infused food. And here in New Jersey, it is legal to use CBD in food. So we do a lot of CBD infused dinners. But at, but at some point, when we get a, uh, you know, when we can start infusing with THC, those dinner parties can be a lot of fun too. And of course, you get a bunch of different questions. And, and really, when you cook with cannabis, it, it's like having five new spices. Because it really changes flavor profiles. You can pair it with things. Some people pair it with it with wine and other beverages. You can use it to enhance certain dishes, in particular because of the terpenes. So the terpenes have those strong flavors like lemon. And that, of course, can go well with things or like that mushroom woodsy taste. So wow. I think if you, if you appreciate cooking and flavors, once you, once you dip your toe into the cannabis world that way, you, you may as well have found five new spices. And you can just be your, your imagination is your only limitation. I mean, I love that. I mean, you know, it's so funny. From the beginning, I could tell your passion for cooking with cannabis. And this is like a topic that you really, really love. But that's something I haven't heard about before, right? You always think about, and it just kind of falls into that same aspect of so much of what we talk about when it comes to testing and everybody just wants the most potency, you know, THC high potency. And they just, they're not thinking so much about the terpenes and the flavor and the other cannabinoids. And I think we kind of get into that as well when we talk about cooking, right? It's like, how high am I going to get kind of thing? <laughs> but you brought up like a whole other aspect that I never even thought about, right? I mean, whenever, you know, whenever somebody's making brownies or something, I'm like, oh, how many should I have? I'm like asking right? For kind of potency, you know, okay, well, there's this many milligrams per, okay, cool. That's kind of what we're looking at. But you brought up a whole nother thing I never really thought about, like I said, is that there, it's five spices. Talk to me about that, right? I mean, give me a little quick rundown. I know that this is probably something that could be a whole class and a whole online course in and of itself, but talk to me, right? I, you know, as a, as a nunnik, as somebody who's just getting started with this, right? I'm just getting started. Let's just say I'm just getting started with cooking with cannabis. How can I maximize my flavors and, and turn it into these five spices you're talking about? Uh, sure. Well, what you do is you do start with looking at the terpenes and you find uh, terpene strains that fit with particular food. So a quick example is like fish and parchment. 
fish and parchment sounds like a fancy dish and it, it's a great little presentation for groups of about six to ten but basically what you do is when you make your oil because that's the that's the cornerstone of all the cooking with cannabis is you, you use something that has some fat in it so you use butter and or oil olive oil neutral oil and then you use that when you cook so if you have something like a, a fish and parchment you get you get a strain that has very high lemony lemony flavor to it and you make that into olive oil so it still has that big lemon taste to it and so then when you wrap your fish you drizzle that olive oil on there and and you probably put a couple lemon slices on there as well so once you open it up and all that you, you really t you can really taste it but that's an example of where you whatever dishes you're making and whatever predominant flavors they have you match that with the terpenes and there's actually some some good uh, farmers you can talk to too that will send you specific strains so there's a cbd farm that i've worked with out in uh, out in oregon tweedle farms and so i talked to their grower and i said all right here's the kind of stuff i'm thinking about and he will actually match up his flower and send out the flower that matches with the particular food. So it's a nice, a nice way to work together. Wow. Wow. Incredible. My mind is blown. That's why I'm telling you, I love this. I love this because it's, you know, for you, it's just a matter of fact, it's just something that, ah, oh, whatever, you know, and it's something that to me, it's like, oh, I mean, I've been cooking with cannabis for a long time. Right. But I never really looked at it like that and getting into like that. So uh, you definitely gave me a lot of homework to do. So thanks a lot, professor. I appreciate that. <laughs> you got it. And I'm also always very careful with dosing. So I do, I do I do tell people what the uh, what the effects are, and I find out their past experience, and then I often finish dishes with the infused oil so they know exactly what they're getting. Mm. So oftentimes I'll make something like a great example is gazpacho. So if you have gazpacho, and, and I've infused some olive oil, uh, you can actually find out what the person's experience is, what their tolerance level is, and then if they want to go really slow, maybe two and a half milligrams. So you literally take the teaspoon and you show them exactly what you're putting in there, you mix it up. And, and they taste it, they have the experience. And my goal is basically, if they don't feel anything, that's great. They know they can kind of go up next time. So if you tried two and a half, not, didn't really feel anything, go to five next time, go to seven and a half, go to 10. You'll, fi you'll find your, your space and you'll also figure out how long it takes to affect you. Cause it does take 30 minutes up to two hours for traditional edibles. And I can tell you for like, from my experience, I know I'm like 50 minutes about 50 minutes up to an hour 10 at the, at the very latest that I know that's when the effects take place. But it took, you know, it took a lot, a lot of time for me to figure out that was the, that was the kind of level. So I do tell people, you know, go low and slow, figure out what your tolerance level is, figure out when it kicks in. And then you can always have a good experience with edibles. Don't be one of those people that jumps out and has too big of a dose to start with or get impatient and then have a second dose. And that first one is still coming. Those are the two things that will, will give you a bad edibles experience. Wow. Wow. You know, it's, uh, it, it is really a lot. And, you know, that, I think that was kind of, for me, being someone with ADHD and patience, and that's kind of why I kind of even got into cannabis so much and loved it. I remember, you know, having edibles and getting impatient, be like, oh my gosh, I'm not even like, not even <laughs> you know, and then you smoke and then it kicks in and then it's like, holy crap, what just happened? You know what I mean? It's like, uh, okay, take a little bit, have the patience. Forget about it. You know, don't just sit there looking at your watch. You know, it's not like watching paint dry, you know, and, and then it'll, it'll be a good time, you know? So I think, yeah, that plays into it. And like you said, right. Really having that, that oil measured out, knowing exactly what it is, how many milligrams is each, you know, each teaspoon, each tablespoon, right. So you, when you're making that fish, right. You're not making uh, something that's going to knock you out right afterwards, you know, something you can actually enjoy for sure. So. Yeah, uh, exactly. Well, cool. Professor Mejia. I really enjoyed this, you know, I guess uh, before I let you go, though, right? I mean, I always ask everybody on the show and, and uh, you know, you have so much wealth of knowledge from so many different areas. And, and now, obviously, as a professor in cannabis, you know, how you define success, whether professionally, personally, spiritually, otherwise, right? What does success look like for you? I think for me, it's about making impact. And I think that impact can either be an individual student or person that I reach and I either help them uh, to become healthier or maybe I help them find an internship or a job, or it could be a bigger crowd. So, so my big thing is I think that I would consider success that at the end of the day, if I had uh, some people around me saying that I made a positive impact on their life. Well, you're definitely in a prime position to be making a huge impact on not just individuals, but on the world, on the next generation of cannabis entrepreneurs. It's something that no one has ever, ever, ever really been able to, unless, you know, you, you go and you spend time up and, you know, the, the 
Northern California and, and Colorado and more recently and, and being able to really being mentored by somebody who's been doing it. And even then it was really just certain aspects of that legacy market, right? You know, you weren't talking about necessarily the, the marketing side, the web development side, all these other things that are going into what's going on now. So we are really yeah. actually, you know, we talk, unfortunately we live in a generation and a little bit where we look at the negatives and wanting the past and, oh man, it's not like it used to be. And good. I'm glad it's not like it used to be right. Like people used to, they still are being incarcerated for, for marijuana, for, for cannabis. And, and it, but it was way worse before, right. You know, at least we're bringing some light to it. And, you know, we're, we're in a place now where, where the industry is opening up and I don't necessarily want to go back. I, I love where we are right now and I want to see it continue to progress, continue to grow in a positive way. So there's no yeah. doubt that, that, that you're doing a great job in, in that impact. Well, but before we take off, can I ask you, how, how, how do you define success? How do I define success? For me, success is progress, right? So progress over perfection, right? Like done is better than perfect. Like I said, you know, ADHD is, is a big part of who I am as a person because it's something that I've had to struggle with my entire life, right? Since six, seven years old. So it's been something that I've had to, to really, you know, find my way with my brain chemistry and being able to succeed. And thank God, you know, I've been successful in my own ways in the sense that what is success? Progress. I'm making progress, right? I'm, I'm doing something I'm better than I was yesterday. And I always have a lot of, you know, whenever I just turned 36, actually, I'm turning 36 on the 12th um, of February. So by the time this comes out, I'm just 36, right? And I have some time to reflect, right? And say, wow, 36. So cool. Where was I a year ago? I made a lot of progress from, from a year ago, right? Where was I two years ago? Made a lot of progress from 34. Where was I when I was 30? Oh my gosh. Like, I can't even imagine. Where was I when I was 25? <laughs> what? Like, I don't want to go down there. Where was I when I was 20? What? You know, I was selling weed and blah, blah, blah. Where was I when I was 18? Just half my life ago, right? 18, you know? And then, so in this way, I can really see, wow, I've had a lot, a lot of success. I've had a lot of success because I'm, I've progressed so much. I'm, I'm in such a different place personally, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, you know, and, and all these kind of things, I've made a lot, a lot of progress, right? And, you know, and, and you know, like I said, spirituality and the, these things that, that really is the main focus of my life and to see where I'm at right now, I can't, I can't even imagine, you know, just how much more open my, my brain and my soul and all these kind of things are, you know, so I'm really, really grateful for that. So I know that was a long winded answer, but definitely for me, that success is progress. It's just like, I'm better today than I was yesterday. And maybe yeah. I'm worse today than I was yesterday. But in the long term, you know, it's not always linear, you know, maybe I got to take two steps, you know, one step back for two steps forward. And, and in this way, we're really seeing ourselves when we look back on our life and saying, wow, you know what, I have come a long way instead of being in the being in the forest and always being judgy on ourselves and being negative with ourselves with our head, you know, being able to take a step back and say, wow, this is really awesome. We've really done it. We've really come a long way. So Absolutely. thanks for that opportunity. I haven't really been on asked that before I'm on the show. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Well, Professor Rob Mejia, you are an OG. You are a gangster. You are, a, <laughs> you are somebody who's shaping the future of not just the cannabis industry, but of, of young people around, you know, I guess New Jersey, but really it, these people will be around the, the country and around the world, because as we know, pretty soon this thing is going to be global. We will be able to not just MSO, yep. but, uh, you know, CSO, I guess, right? So uh, whatever, uh, MCO, I guess it should be whatever it is, right? So in any case, you know, I really appreciate you as we close, you know, how can listeners find out more about you, find out more about our community harvest, find out more about what you're doing and, and the different projects that you're involved with and become involved and connect with you? Uh, sure. Well, the, um, the website is for our community harvest is our community harvest.com. So nice and easy. And then also I, I am fairly active on uh LinkedIn, and then also on Twitter. So I do put a schedule of events that I'm doing, speaking engagements, all kinds of things like that. And of course, if you're uh, in New Jersey and you're thinking about going to college, consider minoring in cannabis studies. You'll end up in one of my classes and I can guarantee you will have a good time. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And I love it. Perse Professor Rob Mejia right here. What a, you know, really, I'm, I'm blown away by this and I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for jumping on with me and thank you everybody, wherever you're listening right now. Thank you so much for, for, for dropping in and listening to this as well. I hope it was as educational as it was for me. So Professor Rob Mejia, good luck to you and the rest of the year and beyond. Thank you very much for this opportunity and have a very good week. I appreciate the time. Thank you so much.
Thanks for listening to Dank Discussions. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Please make sure you subscribe and leave a review. We want to continue making dank content you want to hear, so give us some feedback about the topics you want covered. Feel free to reach out to us at grow at calican.com. That's G-R-O-W at C-A-L-A-C-A-N-N dot com. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter for our latest updates.